there. Last there, just take it up to the departure end of the runway, then a left turn and a left downwind. Cessna over the threshold, coming up on the white dot, Adderby on the white dot, left turn first available. I got a high wind coming up on about a half mile final, clear to land Adderby on. Traffic on the left face, you're following a Cessna down, low off your left. Square it up just a little bit, and then we're going to get you in. Start your descent, though. Start your descent on the base. Traffic on final, give me follow on base. Base traffic, start turning toward the numbers now. High wing coming up on quarter mile final, take it all the way down to the green. Cessna taxiing on the green, expedite down to the next hard surface. Get me some speed, there you go, 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 go fast. This is going to be good. I got traffic on a mile final. You're following traffic ahead and to your right. High wing coming up on the threshold. Take it all the way down to the green dot. Stop Charlie Sierra. Two mile final. A mile final. Turn north. Turn north. And we're going to just make you, uh, we're going to bring you back around. Jet traffic's coming up on about a mile and a half final runway. Nine are clear to land. Okay. All right. Let's, let's, let's listen up, guys. If you're on final for runway nine, I want you to offset to the left. I got a jet that's landing on runway nine. The jet's cleared to land runway nine if you can make it. If not, just continue straight ahead. It looks like you're going around for the jet. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, we had one right in front of us, sir. Dragger. Let's see. What we got? A tricycle. Tricycle. Put it down. Tricycle. Put it down. Tricycle. Put it down. Tail dragger. Down to the green. Uh, green dot. Then a left turn. Short final here. You click land on nine. All the way to the white dot. Go down to the white dot. Find somebody to follow out here. Canard, just come to the runway, and I might have to just send you around. That'll be fine. And for the jet, you just want to stay in this pattern, or you want to go back out for an instrument approach? Stay in a pattern. Charlie here. All right, just stay with me here for a minute. And my tail dragger, and eh, let's see, over the numbers, go down to the green. Come on. And Canard's going to have to go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. And my uh, high wing here over the runway, keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. You do not descend. Do not descend. you got a fast guy behind you. Do not descend. My head. There you go. Keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. As soon as the guy behind you gets uh, slowed down, I'm going to put you down. So keep it airborne. The uh, one that just passed the white dot, make a left turn on the hard surface. All right, my uh, high wing tail dragger, you can put it down now. You can put it down now. And Charlie Sierra, let me get you about a mile off. Let's see, Charlie Sierra, I lost. There you are. Make a left hand turn. I'll try to resequence you here on the down ones. We'll see how it looks. Short final, you're clear to land runway nine on the white dot. Clear to land on the white dot. There you go. And the tricycle left on the hard surface and follow the flagman. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being part of the show. And let's see, just find somebody to follow out those, uh, follow on the final, and as you get close to the runway, if it's not going to work, we're going to send you around and then try to resequence you. Now, who else got sent around that's not back on the downwind? The Canard? Yeah, Canard. All right, Canard, there's a golf stream up there that went around, too. I just lost sight of him, but you're going to make kind of a left-hand turn and stay low. I think Charlie's here once you're out, dude. 3,200. Okay, that'll be fine. Just maintain VFR. I don't know what else is up there above you. Probably most everybody's down here. So just make a left-hand turn. We'll try to get uh, try to get you back here. Canard got the uh, jet inside. Okay, the RV, maybe an RV-10, whatever, secure on final. Keep your speed up and go all the way down to the... Uh, aim for the green dot for me. Uh, actually, keep your speed up. There's a guy behind you. Aim for the green dot, and I'm sure that's plenty of room for you to land on runway 9. You're going to land on runway 9. Number two... You're going to go down to the white dot. Follow the white dot. Actually, you know what? That's 1,500 feet. You're going to land at the white dot. The uh, spacing looks adequate here. Two guys on final. You're kind of tight there. Keep each other in sight. And you're going to uh, aim for the white dot. If it's not going to work, we'll do. Uh, we'll come up with a plan B. We might have to send you around. The second guy behind you out there in about a two-mile final. Are you slow enough to be able to follow that guy in front of you? You need to go around. We have to follow. Well, I probably shouldn't ask that because I had about five guys answer me. So I should know better than that. After 35 years, you would think, right? All right, so uh, let me see. The guy who's number one, it's number one. What kind of airplane is he? An RV type. All right, RV type. Keep it airborne for me. Keep it airborne. And I got a fast guy behind you. The number two guy over the uh, uh, trees there. Go ahead and put it down on the numbers. Put it down on the numbers. My first guy just coming up on the numbers at the, uh, over the grass at the numbers. I want you to keep T minus one minute and counting. Hello. Three, two, one. Hello. 
hello, 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 hello. Thank you to this lovely Thursday evening live stream. It's, it's bloody beautiful out there, isn't it? We've got Simon in the green room. We can punish him later. First of all, I need to introduce you to David Norman, who is bottom left on my screen. Not sure where he is. Hello. Anyway, David, David was in a pub in Manchester sometime last November. Um, and bidding furiously on the opportunity to come and be a guest presenter on the live stream during the Airability Ball. Airability, that fantastic charity that you should all donate to, obviously. Um, and he won. So here we are, David. It's taken a while to get you. We welcome you. Um, David started flying with his father back when he was um, nine, I think he was. Oh, no, he did nine hours back in 1989. I have no idea he was, how old he was in 1989. But anyway, he kind of uh, didn't, didn't, didn't fly for a while, about 26 years, funnily enough, then pitched up at Blackbush and went, these are still valid. And they went, yeah, it might be a little bit rusty, I guess, since then. Um, <laughs> got into this PPL, um, and went down the route that most of us went down, uh, eventually decided that owning was a better way of flying than renting all the time. Ended up with a share in a TB20, which I believe he's still got, um, and recently took the delivery of a uh, low hours Cirrus G3. And is just back from uh, flying 2,000 nautical miles nautical miles, I should say, around South Africa in a in a sling rather than uh, rather than the Cirrus, which was back in the UK, obviously. So uh, welcome, David. David's our guest presenter for tonight. So be gentle with me. You have to be gentle with David. That's OK. <laughs> right. So first of all, before we do anything else, I have to say big, big, big thanks to Sky Demon for supporting as usual. And here is your tip this week. Hi, I'm Rob from Skydemon, and here's another top tip. In this example, we've planned to take the low-level corridor, but we have managed to get a transit to go through Liverpool's airspace. So what we can do is press the Find button up here, and then choose a waypoint further down our route, such as Chorley, and say, Take Shortcut. Now, Skydemon has skipped the intermediate waypoints, going straight to our chosen waypoint. For more information, check out our website, www.skydemon.aero. I like the way that they chose to get the shortcut through Liverpool, because in my experience, Liverpool are always really good and will give you a transit. If they'd yeah. have chosen to take a, a shortcut through Manchester, nobody <laughs> would have believed them. <laughs> like, yeah, you've got that. You pushed the button. It said, were you denied? <laughs> yeah, were you denied? <laughs> Fill in the form here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so with Aero Friedrichshafen just a few weeks away, we're gearing up for our coverage from the event. Um, we're able to do this thanks to the generous support of Continental Aerospace Technologies and Cirrus Aircraft. Who's going to the event? Apart from us. <laughs> yeah. Tell Ed, us Ed, 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 everybody who's anybody, I believe. Yeah, it will be good. Yeah. Now, um, I think I think we're almost on, on... I think we're about 30 millimetres short of the wettest March on record, I think. But okay. Someone who can tell us more about that. Oh, you sun. know your stuff, Johnny. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I'm, I know I'm head of blame, but I was thinking of giving it up anyway. So over to you, Johnny, you can be head of blame from now on. <laughs> that sounds like a tough department to be in charge of. Yeah. <laughs> it is, but it has its perks. You know, it's it's for those of us who, uh, who like to bring misery on others. <laughs> and wow, it's good pretty odd. Sorry, Ed. I said, it's good to see you back. Oh, well, thank you very much. And live and in person, yeah. I've been doing other things for a few weeks. I'm a, I'm a busy chap. And nice to see David as well. You came to Weather School, didn't you, David, a few years ago, if I remember correctly? Yeah, did indeed. On uh, both parts of your Weather School, which I yeah, yeah. very much enjoyed, Simon. Great to see you back. Great to see you back, David. He, he's come yeah. back for more punishment. Uh, right, shall I uh, show you what's going to go on then for the Easter weekend? Yes, do you know what? Actually, it's pretty good news. It's not looking um, that bad. It looks like things are, are just going to open up for a couple of days. 
at the most. Let me just get a decent size on there for you. So things opening up for a couple of days at least, but we've got tomorrow to get out of the way, first of all. Now, today we've had a returning polar maritime air mass across most of England and Wales. That always brings us heavy showers and rain, and that's exactly, of course, what we've got. We've also got it for part of tomorrow, too. So this is the uh, forecast chart for midday tomorrow. We've got a trough through Wales, southwest England, parts of southern England. That's going to be bringing some heavy showers with it into southwestern parts of the country. 3,000 foot bases, tops could be up at 15 to 20,000 feet, maybe some QNIMs in there. Less cloud the further north and east you go, also across Scotland and across northern parts of Ireland. There we should find the cloud more broken, bases three to 4,000 feet, tops about 10,000 feet, but generally better conditions. Now, quite breezy in the southwest as well and across southern coasts of England, could still be gusting to 25 to 30 knots. However, come Saturday, things change this is the sort of chart we want to see well actually we want highs out here it's not not lows but this will do for now particularly given what we've had um it looks like being a generally fair day for most of us decent visibility four thousand foot basis tops at about eight to ten thousand feet two areas of cloud to note one across the far east of east anglia there we could just find some cloud drifting in one or two showers Bases two, two and a half thousand feet, but I'm hopeful they will lift in the afternoon. Another area of cloud just across southwest Scotland, which may just produce some showers there. But for most of us, much lighter winds, pretty good for ballooning, actually, Sam. Mm -hmm. And um, it looks like it should be a fair day. Easter Sunday is looking not bad as well. The wind's going into the southeast. Now, there's a little area of showers that might want to develop across eastern parts of Wales. Bases, if those showers come along 2,000 feet with the tops, about 12,000 feet. But I'm hopeful, actually, that those tops will be a little bit lower, the base is a little bit higher. So even here, I think Sunday, perhaps not too bad a day. That southeasterly, probably coming in at about 15 to 18 knots across the south. Across Scotland, though, fair conditions all the way. Now, Easter Monday, don't despair too much if you're across southern England on Easter Monday. I'm not sure this is exactly how this is going to turn out. I think the rain could be a little bit further south, but still there is the possibility that sort of Midlands, East Anglia, southeast, southern parts of England may be rained out through uh, bank holiday Monday. But like I say, I'm, I'm kind of keeping things crossed. This may be too pessimistic a picture. For Northern England, for Scotland, for Western Wales, for Northern Ireland, here, generally fair conditions. Northern France, if you were thinking about across the channel, just forget it. I don't think that is going to be happening. So generally, actually, for the Easter weekend, considering what we've had, not too bad at all. Um, now, if you want to learn more weather, just like David did, come along to Aviation Weather School Part 1, my classroom-based course. Yes, you'd have to put with me all day long between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. here at Weather School HQ on Saturday the 13th of April. Uh, the price includes your lunch and you get me. What more could you ask for? Go to weatherschool.co.uk and you can book your place now. Right, that's it. I'm off. Have a great Easter weekend. Thank you very much, Simon. Enjoy your eggs. See ya. Bye. I will. See ya. Uh, there was a good oh. comment. Nick Allen said, so it's meh Friday, not good Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Very... thank you, Simon. I, I hope Simon's wrong about Monday. I'm planning to go to Jersey on Saturday, come back Monday. So, mm. yeah, let's, we'll see. Let's see how it goes. So, yep. uh, anyway, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Team Flyer, for having me. And uh, thanks, Arability, for giving me the opportunity to be here. And I'd like to announce the question of the week is, have you flown in Scotland? The reason for this will become apparent later on in the program. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It will That's be. Okay. <clears throat> now, for people who aren't members, there's the banner. Got it. Uh, yeah, you can join if you aren't a member. £5 a month, fly.co.uk forward slash membership. Um, lots going on at the moment. So we've got a few days left of March. And you can visit Straven, Spanho, Wickham, Carnarvon, and Blackpool with free landings or discounted, uh, discounted at Blackpool. Um, <clears throat> we've, you can catch up on the last webinar on staying healthy whilst flying, which happened earlier this month. And April thirtieth is our next one, and that's going to be Simon or Cy Wilson rather of uh, Fleet Air Arm fame, and he's going to be talking about flying tail draggers. Um, Notably, he's, he's a swordfish pilot that some of you probably know. Um, and we've got, thanks to Annabelle, a huge list of April 
landing vouchers, most of which, as David just alluded to, are in Scotland. So we've got Dornoch, Sky, Glenforza, Easter, Perth, alongside Kingsmuir, Fife, Ballado, and Clench Common in Wiltshire. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 10, 10 free landing vouchers for April, which must, must equal the monthly fee. Well, sorry, the yearly fee. The yearly fee, I would have thought. Yeah, that's, that's, got to be a, that's got to be a record. And, they'll, and throughout the month, there'll be various bits of Scottish crap editorial and, and, and some look backs on some flying adventures that have been in Scotland. So April, when the sun's going to shine, the rain's going to go away, the strips are all <laughs> going to become dry and rock hard, it's going to be time to go visit Scotland. And I will certainly do my very best to get out there. I believe mm -hmm. uh, some people are heading up. Is it this weekend coming that there's an event at Glenforster? I think maybe. I, I know a few yeah. people are talking about heading up there this weekend. So um, yeah. there we yeah. go. Off to Glen yeah. Forster tomorrow. Yeah. Well, it's off there I, I think that I, I would do almost issue a challenge now to anyone who, who's any club member who has the free landing fees. It's like, see if you can do all in a day, maybe. Yeah. Someone who isn't Paul <laughs> Goodell. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that for some people, it would take a day to get to Scotland. But yeah. like, in, in, okay. in your. I tell you what. It, your your challenge starts when you cross the border. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd say, I'd talk, just a, a very short story, nothing to do with flying, but a couple of years ago, I did the bike, that bike for Adlands and St. Johnny Groats. You did? And you eventually cross the border at kind of Gretna. And you think, oh, I'm in Scotland and I'm nearly finished. And you look at the map and you go, what the? Hey, it's yeah. a long <laughs> way back up to the north mm -hmm. of bloody John O'Groats. It's, it's, it's a big place, place in that Scotland, you know? It is. But yeah. stunningly beautiful, stunningly beautiful. Very yeah, good. So, news. Yeah. News. Right, we're going to rattle through the news because we've got our amazing guest, Dave Boxall, sitting in the green room, and I'm sure you'd all rather listen to him than me. So, the first news story is, as you know, from the uh, Border Force, Create a Gar. Um, coming in April, there are some new rules and regulations, which mean that, effectively, most of your Gar submissions will need to go through the Escar, the government thing, online. Whoops. Unfortunately, the government, being what the government are, decided that if you happen to not fly from an ICAO uh, airfield, which many, many, many of us don't these days, they want you to put in things like the lat and long, but in degrees, minutes and seconds. So that means you need to go onto Google Earth or somewhere else, have a look at this, find a website that bloody translates it. I'm sure there's a sum that does it, but I don't know what it is, and then work that out. You put that in there and then work your way through the full, which is not particularly well explained, to be perfectly honest, because you get to a page, you go, it wants a return journey already, but I think it probably wants your destination, but who knows? Um, and then eventually you come to a bit where you have to put in the home base of the aircraft, which they again want in Latin Long if you're based on a strip. But this time, just to catch you out, they want it in Latin Long to four decimal places, not hours, minutes and seconds anymore. Duh. And then when they give you the summary after having put your ICAO codes in, they give you in IATA codes. Duh. I mean, what the... I, I really don't know what they're playing. There was, there was a, um, a, a full-on consultation. They came to all sorts of shows, and people spoke to them, and people explained that they were talking out their backside, and they needed to change it. And what did they do? They just went. I think it was one of those consultations. It was a consultation in name only. A CNO or something. Yeah, we'll, uh, maybe we'll coin that for some of the CA ones. A CNO. So it's a, they just ignored it, and they, they, they're kind of going, uh, anyway, they're a complete pain in the backside. And, and really, what we really want and what everyone wants is to be able to go onto apps like Skydemon and pre populate the uh, the SGAR forms like that. I mean, you can do it with an Excel template. But funnily enough, the Excel template they provided doesn't allow you to put Latin long in. That's got to be in bloody IKO stuff. I mean, really? And they know where all these bloody certificate of airworthiness are. Certificate of, Earth, certificate of agreement, I should say, airfields are. They know where they are. They could just take the name. They could take, what, three words. They could take postcodes. There's like a thousand easy ways of doing it. What do they do? I know. Let's pick the hardest one, and let's make the two different standards for two different parts of the form. What a bunch of muppets, I'm afraid. Dave White says, the example gives a location to three decimal places of seconds, which is about 32 millimetres. But Pete says, if you get the lat long wrong, they will probably come and visit yeah. you when you land. Well, of course, the thing is that now, I mean, the other thing, you look through it as 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 the captain of the flight, you're responsible for checking the passports. And it kind of, there's a link to a huge document that teaches you how to check passports and visas and all sorts of other bits and pieces. It's like massively complex. And soon, uh, for those who don't have the right to reside in the UK, there'll be all sorts of bits where they that you have to 
wait to get an approval from them that, that's starting in March, uh, approval to travel. Anyway, it's, it's, if you can imagine the worst of government IT following a consultation that was pointless because they didn't bother to listen, then, then that's kind of what we got, really. That's what this is. That's what that is, yeah. So good luck, everybody. Um, I suggest that there are some email contact addresses on the form. I suggest you ask lots of questions and encourage them to get it sorted out because otherwise it's going to be a right real pain in the backside. And if you happen to be, it's not too bad on an iPhone, to be perfectly honest, but if, you, if you're if you using one of those Android phones, it's not, it's not ideal. And otherwise, you've got to kind of take a laptop with you overseas to be able to... Yeah, Paul Beadle says uh, online GAR seems to work, but online GAR is going away, isn't it? So, well, there's a there's a bit of a debate over whether online GAR is going away because online GAR at the moment currently doesn't is, isn't set up in order to take the approval to travel kind of thing, and, and they're hoping to get an approval to travel kind of thing. But I think online GAR online GAR's maritime version, online GAR with wet online gar or whatever they call it um is, is going to be that's probably going to go away and whether that then becomes worthwhile to run afterwards or not who knows but it effectively you know 99.9 percent .9 of pilots just want to follow the law do what they need to do and do it easily what they've done here is made it really freaking difficult to do which is which is which is mad but there you go talking of why things that are Ian, yeah. why do you know why can they just change the online car just updated it i think i think there is a hope that they might do that um but i'm not sure that if they do that it will be I, i'm not privy to any of the private discussions that are going on between online gar and the various app providers that it ties into or doesn't tie into um and ultimately we've all been filing gars pretty much free of charge really um <clears throat> and which, which you can do on the scar thing but when you have private companies sitting in there kind of taking the government stuff and making it easy no one that the, no one is currently really paying those or well someone's really paying them but it's not us and i think the people paying for them are probably getting to the point where they need yeah. to decide what they want to carry on anyway it's it's all a bit of a okay. yeah a bit of a mess but there you go cool Talk right. to say, on, sorry carry on on to the next yeah. item yeah next item yeah, yeah there we go yeah can I can I just say firstly, it's really weird having usually just watching fly live. It's so strange to actually be here. I, I keep forgetting I'm actually on it, just not watching. So if I if I look like I've disappeared, don't worry. <laughs> I'm just enjoying watching. You are Dave Colby. Uh, anyway, next. Yeah, next. Uh, thank you. Yeah, there you go. Namesake. So next news article. Um, which is the aero slot debacle so it seems like uh, unlike german breweries it appears that the organizers of aero can't organize the proverbial following problems of previous years it appears the whole business of booking arrival slots has just been a whole lot worse this year uh, to make things worse there was then a data breach that released personal details including addresses emails aircraft type aircraft details so uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people up in arms over that and just hope they uh, they actually learn from it and uh, it gets better next year. We've had three or four years to learn from it and they've so far failed to learn. Yeah. Um, well, sounds like they've succeeded in getting worse each year. They, but yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. I think they have. I think they have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next up, a uh, real quick one. The CAA, as we've mentioned before, they're consulting on flight information services and possible ideas to revert to an ICAO compliance system. So that would mean doing away with basic procedural deconfliction and all that stuff. Um, the consultation ends tomorrow. Uh, we've got a link, which I think we can post in the comments. Um, so you can go along and get involved in that if you want to. Um, so yeah, it could be, yeah, it could have some impacts on us. Yeah, people should, people should get, people should go and take a look and have a go at have a go at the consultation. There's some interesting stuff there for the future. Yeah. There's, a, there's a link in the comments. I'd imagine if we could stop saying basic traffic or other services. It's quite funny because when you go to France where they don't have basic traffic and deconfliction stuff, but everyone still uses, but almost everyone still uses basic traffic and deconfliction. Uh, the French controllers have just kind of got used to it and go, yeah, whatever. And just kind of carry on with it. <laughs> 
but uh, maybe you can yeah. come up with a conspicuosity with that, like a conspicuosity <laughs> service or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are, they, I mean, do you think in the CA there's like there was like one of those management meetings where I was sitting around going, okay, we failed to invent a rounder wheel. We might have to revert to the round wheel that we had before. Yes, quick, we'll yeah. give it a new name. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, some Britain Norman news. Um, Britain Norman have been saved. Um, so they were obviously on the brink of administration, uh, and they've had new investment to fund working capital uh, and to drive long-term growth. This has come from a group of investors led by private equity firm 4D Capital Partners. <clears throat> um, you may remember in February this year, Britain Norman confirmed it intended to appoint an administrator for protection of the company. Um, so um, this is good news. But um, it was one of those stories that kind of we, we were hearing about and it wasn't really confirmed. So, um, yeah, no, interesting, interesting times, but good to know that they are secure. So, so they, they, they've been rescued by, by some external capital at roughly yep. at the same time that the Technam have, cert have certified the stole version of their P2012. So uh, yeah. basically they, they took the normal P2012 and stuck a couple of extra meters on the wing. Uh, yep. to take off. I mean, bear, bear in mind, you can fit 11 people in there, two, two crew and nine passengers. Yeah. And you can reconfigure for ambulance or cargo. Um, and it's, and it's, it's, it's more, got more powerful engines as well, isn't it? Yeah, I can't, I'm trying to remember, 375 horsepower per side of geared like homings but apparently yeah. they're not geared like homings like you used to have in the 41 golden eagle where no. you had like a little a little big check on the end of it like this is i was going to say fifty thousand dollars but you can't even get an a3 ia360 for that now no. so yeah. this is a hundred thousand dollar check don't touch this lever um, yes. so apparently these ones are much more um robust resilient is the word and it's pretty, um, I, I think it's quite a pretty airplane but yeah um, it's quite a pretty yeah. airplane yeah, it's so, than that. yeah. I mean, I think I think the Islander actually kind of nails it in terms of pure performance because the the Stoll Technam lands in 350 meters, which is not too shabby, is it? And the and the <coughs> takeoff, I think, fully loaded is 450 meters. Yeah, so well, I guess you know how ma how many commercial operations are in the world where you need to land in less than that? Probably not that many. Yeah, and it's taken, taken a while to get certification because we announced, we first talked about news of that stall P2012 back in the end of 2022. So it just goes to show how slow things can move. I had a, When Technam had their 75th anniversary, I had a ride in the back of one of those. So it was uh, terrifying. <laughs> uh, probably you're not going to say any more at this point. No, it's great. It's a great airplane. It was quite yeah. comfortable uh, and stuff like that. It was, yeah, the airplane. Was, the airplane was good, wasn't it? I think it was a demo flight. I'm, I hate being in the back during yeah. demo flights. You have absolutely no control. And there's someone up front going, I can't do the Italian accent, but someone up front going, Watch this, watch this, watch this. And I'm going, <laughs> Stop. Good airplane, good airplane, mate. Hold my Peroni. Or yes. Something. Um, yeah, I'm going. Excellent. Anyway, yeah. So, next item, next item is uh, flying car news. The story of flying cars goes on. And uh, apparently the Klein Air Car, which was seen last year on Amazon's Grand Tour, uh, apparently even uh, Jeremy Clarkson was uh, lost for words, which is a rare occasion. Uh, it's going into production in China uh, okay. as a result of license agreement between, is it Klein Vision, the manufacturer, uh, or the, the, the design company with a Chinese company that I won't even try to uh, to pronounce. Um, so is, it, is this the start of avoiding the inevitable delays on the M25? Is it really going to happen? I don't think so. Partly because it's not like you get to unfold. You go, I'm in a traffic jam. I'll just unfold my flying car and fly away. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, it's, exactly. So this is a, a flying car where it's like, hang on, I'll just drive to the airfield and then oh. and then unfold it. So I wondered if it was called Klein from the German for little on the basis that Aero Friedrichshafen had no slots left and everyone else could just use that to drive in instead. <laughs> Very nice. It would be like detailing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Who Some knows? airfield. It is still it is still quite cool though, don't you think? It 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 is. It is, but it's slightly awkward. You know, it's one of those things you can't meld a car and an aeroplane together and get a good, uh, it, the history of flying cars has taught us that they are not two good things to go together. 
No. Yeah. No. Maybe maybe it needs Tesla to bring one out. I, you know, I think um, we all do. There was talk, wasn't there, at one time uh, that um, that uh, Elon Musk was going to come up with an aeroplane. So, um, well, Elon Musk's father was a pilot. Yeah, and there, was, there was a family aeroplane that's long, long lost, and no one really knows where it is. And I don't think it was anything special. It was probably like you know, whatever the, but not the Sudabria, not the Champ, something up from the Champ, whatever it is. I can't remember what it was. But oh, okay. Uh, apparently that's kind of long lost somewhere so yeah. I, think, I think elon even elon who's currently slowly going mad i think um looks at it and thought aviation should we get into that no <laughs> won't do that yeah but the, he has announced the sports that has got something to do with the with a collaboration with spacex as well and supposed to have some insane acceleration okay. so whether, mm -hmm. whether that will have jet packs in it or so or who knows who knows who yeah. knows anyway yeah um, some very quick airfield news. Um, lots of places with quite a bit of news. Uh, Tolerton, uh, as you might know, might have heard, uh, Nottingham City Airport is under threat um, from multiple housing projects. A second application for new homes on the site was put in last week. Um, at Coventry, uh, they're trying the Giga Factory thing again. Um, and this is a, the proposed site for the Green Power Park, the UK Centre of electric, Electrification and Green Energy. Um, and uh, at the West, the West, West Midlands Gigafactory will be its anger tenant, but the plan includes a clean energy ecosystem. Um, South End are in administration. Now, we had reported that South End, um, a big chunk of that, £193 million pounds worth, was sold to uh, the Carlisle Global Infrastructure uh, Fund to settle a debt. Well, they did that and anyway, still ended up, the um, owners of uh, South End Airport have ended up appointing administrators um, after um, revealing that a potential restructuring plan was no longer commercially viable. So, um, uh, at Doncaster, Airlander, the, um, that giant blimp type thing, uh, is to be built on a, on a site northeast of Doncaster, uh, on the other side of the city from the airport. Um, City of Doncaster Council and Hybrid Air Hybrid Vehicles have agreed a, a re agreed to locate production at Carcroft Common, so that's exciting. Um, that's going to generate 1,200 jobs, apparently. And some good mm. airfield news, obviously, alongside the Airland news, is that CIA figures uh, for 2023 airport oh. movements show that Gloucester Airport was top dog with a total of 66,106. Uh, second was London, Oxford with 53,000. Uh, third was Brighton City with 40,000. Though I seem to remember an Aero Teeks, who used to be the airfield manager at Gloucester, I remember a few years ago, Gloucester Airport, I think, was in that chart at over 80,000 movements. So um, where have some of those movements gone? Mm. Mm. Elsewhere. 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 Yeah. Last one. Sorry. Amazed Amaze Brighton was third. Yeah, yeah, yeah forty thousand movements. That seems seems a lot of movements for Brighton. It, it does. I I wonder because that what was were they twenty twenty three movement numbers? Yes. Yeah. So that would have yeah, that would have probably included quite a lot of FTA uh, okay. movements before flight time aviation ceased trading. Yeah. Okay. I don't know whether that will continue, but See there would have been a lot of training movements from them, wouldn't there? Yeah. 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 I guess. Okay. Yeah. Boom. Yeah, right. Last story. Um, so Boom Supersonic, which is a company that attempted to build a Concorde successor, have flown their XB1, which is a tech demonstrator. Um, and that's kind of the first step towards launching their supersonic airliner, which is going to be called Overture. Um, the XB1 was flown by Bill Shoemaker, the chief test pilot uh, from Mojave Air and Spaceport. And they said it met all their test objectives. It reached 7,000 feet and about 240 knots. Um, it's eight. Well, the overture is aiming at carrying between 65 and 80 passengers at Mach 1.7. So not quite Concorde. We're no. still not not able to do what we were 50 years ago. Um, and of course, it's going to be designed to run on SAF sustainable aviation fuel as well. So yeah, first step. Very good. Yeah, mm. absolutely. I'm Darren, sorry. Darren. Gloucester reminds us, 92,000 was a peak wow. in the early Ooh. 90s at Gloucester. So, wow. And, wow. And that's about 20,000 down in six years, the current total. 
can say. Hmm. It was a busy place. That was a busy place. I remember, do you remember we did a flight test there once? We were like stuck at the hold. We were like number seven at the hold or something. It was in a, it wasn't a burka, it was some other. It was, a, it was a cozy. You and I had taken off and then we and then we watched. We just orbited over ahead. And yeah. waited. It was ages, wasn't it? It was, it was. And that was, what, yeah. Yeah, anyway, probably best, less said the better. Right, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's bring on Dave Boxer. Hi. Hello. Hello, Dave. Here we go. Evening, Dave. Thanks Good evening. For Thanks for having me. So um, you've been in and around ballooning basically all your life, from flying in them, designing them, constructing them, breaking records with them. Um, and I think you retired yesterday. Yesterday, yes. Yeah. So I left the Bruins yesterday. So I'm a gentleman of leisure now. Congratulations. And yeah, thanks for joining us. So we'll kick off. Just tell us how balloons first appeared in your life. So I think as a, as a teenager, I was just you know fascinated by anything that flew. Oh, this is a me. Um, I think in my late teens, I got my pilot's license in 82. And that's actually on Lake Windermere. The, I'm in a balloon basket and the balloon's actually sitting on the on the lake there. But yeah, I was fascinated by anything that flew and I bought kites and model balloons. And I was really keen to to start, you know, get into flying something. And, and of course, you know, airplanes and gliding, it's all happening at airfields out in the middle of nowhere and I couldn't drive. But balloons were taking off from um, Ashton Court in Bristol. And I could get there on my bike um, and yeah, and just turn up, help people launch. You know, sometimes I get dragged along on the on the retrieve car, chasing the balloons. And that's how I got into it as a sport. And I uh, got my pilot's license when I was 18 in 1982. Um, and then um, flew balloons as a sport for a while. And then I was um, trained as an engineer, Southampton University, Aeronautical Engineering. And then uh, I got approached by Cameron Balloons um, a few years into my, into my career to design special shape balloons. Fantastic. So am I right in thinking you left, obviously, yesterday as head of airworthiness? I was head of, air, head of airworthiness. So I started with special shape balloons, did a stint doing, we do some camera balloons, we do some non-gas projects. Um, so stage set, also on non-hot air balloon projects. So gas balloons, stage sets, anything same fabric product. So I did that for a few years and then I took over as head of airworthiness. So I've been looking after the initial airworthiness and the continued airworthiness of all our balloons. And we have a huge fleet and we were, currently we're making 100 balloons a year wow. and um and we've got i think our our fleet's about eight that no probably nine thousand balloons we've made over the years so there are, are still a lot out there and we've picked up some some types of certificates of failed manufacturers so yeah a lot of work in there yeah um why give us like a 30 second elevator pitch on why why ballooning what's what's so good about it so um I think it's a very social way to fly. You know, you've got four of you, you've got three or four of you in a little basket. Fletcher and it's like a little little cocktail party. You know, you can all you can all chat. So there's no no headsets, no wind noise, no engine noise. You know, when the burner's going, it's quite loud. Um, and I think the ballooning, it's all about where you're doing it. So having something to see, you know, being somewhere where you, there's something to look down on, um, is is what it's all about. Hey, when you say social on a cocktail party. I've been in a balloon a couple of times, and one of my abiding memories of it is I had to get up at bloody four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that is a bit of a downside. You know, the, I think the evening flights are a bit more relaxed, but you know, we fly early in the mornings and uh, and in the evenings because the the wind's lighter. There's no thermals then because you know when it's turbulent, it get kicks us around. So uh, so yeah, that is the slightly antisocial side. But you get up early. You know, it's really quiet, really calm. You know, very fresh in the day. Have a nice flight or go for breakfast somewhere. Yeah, pretty jolly. Fair enough. Excellent. Sorry, Johnny, to interrupt Sorry. me. I, I, heard, I heard someone speak then, so apologies for talking over you. Um, record breaking then. So the, there's a kind of history of wealthy people coming up with mad ideas of doing things with balloons. How, what, what was your involvement with helping people? So um, I think we've, We've had people, so we, yeah, we've we done uh, Cameron balloons, we've done things like the transatlantic balloon race, so we sent five balloons across the Atlantic um, 
as, as, as a race. But we got really into the, the whole round the world scene. There was a big push in the late 90s to send a balloon round the world, nonstop flight round the world. And that's the Brightling Orbiter 3, the first balloon that, that flew around the world. And they took the best part of 20 days to circumnavigate the world. Um, and so I was, um, I did the envelope design for that one. We had a team building the capsule, pressurized capsule in there for that. Um, and uh, so that was all quite, quite high tech stuff for us. And, um, and then this is uh, the most recent one. So there've been three flights around the world. Um, the oh. intermediate one was Steve Fawcett, who got the, far, uh, the first solo around the world flight. And this is uh, Fedor Konyokov, who's a, who's a Russian fellow, who's an artist and a priest. That's him in his capsule there. So, um, and he got around, uh, he's the fastest one to circumnavigate the world. I think it was like nine days or something. So I was, I was the lead engineer for that project. I went out to Australia to set it up for the launch. He uh, launched out from north in Australia, around the world, and then went straight over the airfield on his return. So that was a pretty good project. Great, great fun to be part of. How, so given that we know that b balloons tend to be meandering beasts sometimes, how do you launch a balloon from Australia and get it to come back to Australia? <laughs> Well, you need a decent weather forecast, right? Is the is the is the first thing. So I think, um, yeah, good weather forecasting. Um, you know, some some reasonable, some good piloting, um, and a little bit of luck. And I think doing it solo. That uh, Fedor Konyakov, the the Russian guy, he was flying solo. He was um, so nine days on his old, uh, own. It was pretty cold up there. You know, he's a hard man. You know, like a lot of these uh, these adventurers. You know, he's done polar stuff, a lot of sailing things. That he's a, he's a really hard guy. I wouldn't have liked to do that flight, but you know, did yeah, you, good piloting, good weather yeah. forecasting, a bit of good luck. Did you not give him a heater if it was cold? We did give him a heater. I think you find all these projects. You're always like strapped for time on them. We had what we thought was a good heater design, um, and I think we found out it could have been better. Oh. <laughs> so, are, are these um, without? giving away too many secrets, are the pilots like Fedor and, and and other people, they're obviously kind of quite special people. Are they difficult to deal with? So, uh, no, actually. So, you know, Fedor was great. And, um, and you know, the better on the Brightling. Yeah, I mean, they're really driven people. But, um, but no, they're, they're absolutely great to deal with. And I think um, if I were to say one one real criticism we had when the whole round the world balloon thing was going on was that we could never get any flight data from the failed flights, because um, I think you decide you're going to fly around the world, you recruit sponsors, you set up your project, and you just believe you have to believe you're going to make it. And data is for losers. If you fly around the world, you don't need any data. So it's it's if if you, you only need data if you fail and you want to do it a second time. So we did. I don't know. Brightling Web was the third time it went round. Um, you know, there were several other attempts, and it was really hard to get anything back from those flights that would have helped with the design for people's next projects. Because, you know, they went off, they were convinced they were going to make it. Why would you record anything? So what was the, on the Brightling one? That obviously, I mean, A, it's got a bit of a weird shape, and B, it's made out of, looks like it's made out of something other than normal balloon material. So what Yeah, so um, all these, the really long distance balloons, so the, all the world balloons that flew around the world, they're mostly lifted by helium gas. So that they're mostly gas balloons. But to sort of stretch the duration out, um, you you heat the gas overnight. So the problem with, with long distance but gas balloons is that when the sun goes down, the gas cools, and then the balloon descends all the way to the ground because it's it's no longer filling the same volume. It's not as buoyant as the air and drops. So if you're in a regular gas balloon, every sunset you throw out 10% of your system mass as ballast. If you have a white balloon and you heat it with a just with propane, you burn about 5% of your system mass as fuel. And so, you know, you can get a white, a rosier balloon, a, a combination hot air and, and gas balloon, you can get about uh, about 10 days on a straight white one. And to go around the world, we reckon we needed 20. And so that's why that um, that Brightling balloon did do 20 days, used nearly all of its fuel up. But it's got, um, that silver is for insulation. It's got some, um, some foam underneath the silver to just give it a bit more insulation. There's a sort of a, a secondary balloon up on the top and the ventilated space up above it to try and dump some of that that heat that it's picking up in the day. So, yeah, it's quite a tricked up balloon. It's not your regular hot air balloon. 
So it's, what's, what's, and the Dave, ratio, what's the ratio? Sorry, I was just going to ask. Can, go for it. can I just ask? Yeah, what sort of altitude do these long distance trips sort of? Do I, what sort of altitudes they got to? So Brightling, they Brightling did a little sprint up. I think Brightling got over. They went up to to over thirty thousand feet just so they could set the Rosier altitude record quite late on in their flight. But they're mostly in the they're mostly in the high twenties. Um, Fedor Konyakov, he was in, a, in an open bar, an, an, well, an unpressurized cup capsule, and he were he was, yeah, in the mid twenties. So, um, wow. so that sort That's of long time, long time to be at that altitude. Yeah, it's a long time. So he, yeah, so Fedor was you know, on an oxygen mask, you know, for ten days. Yeah, Did he shave yeah. his beard on? No, no, he just strapped a mask on top. So you know, lower altitudes on a cannula, a nasal cannula, and higher higher altitudes yeah, with his mask. But Brightling, you know, it was um, that was a pressurized capsule, so it was all like like a little little space capsule. We had oxy, um, scrubbers to take out carbon dioxide, liquid oxygen to t to keep the oxygen levels up. You know, it was uh, like a like a little space life support system in there. Was, was there a cocktail party going on? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the um, one of the other one of the attempts, Cable and Wireless made an attempt. Uh, someone I worked with later on, Andy Elson, he went around and and they had they said every time they came off ship off shift off their uh, off their ship shifts as captain, they would um, have a small glass of red wine. So, uh, so but I think Brightling did that. But yeah. Cool. What's the, what's the ratio just... between the the smallest the envelope goes when it's like cold in the in, in at night and the largest it is when it's very hot and during the day? So I mean the volume change is ten percent. So I suppose you're talking about sort of probably three percent on diameter. It's not a big change, but of course at night what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep the temperature constant day and night so we're heating it during the night so a rose air balloon won't actually have a big big change but if you're flying a gas balloon you'll be up you know flying high the balloons form tight the sun goes down and you just see the, the bottom of the balloon start to crinkle as it as the gas shrinks and the gas cools and cools and drinks and then the balloon starts coming down and as you come down of course the gas shrinks even more and then you get it looking quite floppy so that's kind of like in in terms of a if it was a helicopter what do they call that settling with power it kind of just gets into this like increasingly increased rate of descent as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller um yeah i guess it would be like settling with power yeah so it would just it would just you know make a steady a steady descent all the way to the ground mm. Mm. So, but you know yeah that's what you've got to go into sunset with either enough fuel or enough gas to uh keep you going yeah yeah so uh, obviously besides a, a big career working with around the world um, balloons you are probably i would imagine most people probably know you and camerons for special shapes yes so that was one of my favorites the uh rupert bear mm -hmm. so i designed that back in the 90s so yeah we've made several hundred special shape balloons um and, and the 90s were a huge time time for that. I think at the time there were three of us designing special shaped balloons um, and we were doing probably 30 a year. So you'd always you'd have one that you were working on, one in build, you know, one waiting to be designed. And yeah, we were flat out making special shapes all through the 90s. Yeah, and that is probably the most complex one I've ever worked on. We did at this castle for Disney. And I think it was something like, it was well over a thousand panels, different different shaped pieces of fabric in there. So I think that was 1500 individual patterns. And yeah. some of them get used multiple times in there because all, yeah. the, all the towers are identical, for example. When did, um, when did sort of CAD design come into this? Because presumably there must have been a time when it was intensive designing them. So, um, so when I started, uh, I started in 89, we were using a homebrew CAD system. But um, before that, so really simple shapes you can design, uh, you can design on a drawing board. So something like a can, uh, you can design on a drawing board. So cylindrical thing, boxes you can design on a drawing board. Um, then to get the more complex shapes, uh, Don Cameron designed a homebrew CAD system. And it was, it was quite impressive for it at the time. Um, but of course, then we got more complex and when we started with the CAD, you'd you'd then get your do the CAD and then you get a, a ruler and a, and a pen and you draw the patterns out by hand. And we then we got uh, just after I started, we got a, a pen plotter that drew on drew on brown paper and it would draw the patterns automatically for us. 
Um, and I think now, you know, we've, we've got, um, we've got uh, a really good CAD plotter. We can, uh, and so we go straight from, straight from the CAD to cutting fabric. Um, and actually, you know, it's really, really clever, the, the, the stuff that goes on there, because okay. um, when we want to put graphics on balloons now, oh, this is our sewing floor. Um, but yeah, when we want to put graphics on balloons, that's all done on CAD now. We've got um, printers. We've got a big printer that will print on the balloon fabric. And then there's a camera on the um, on the cutting machine that will read registration marks from the, the, the printers left and be able to cut out the edge of the pattern. So yeah, so we've really been really with that. In, in the 90s, when special shapes were at their height, as it were, were there any projects that someone said, here, Dave, I want this thing. And you went, that no, can't be done. Sorry. Yeah, there are always there are always a few. Um, you know, we always the joke was always that we could do a, we could do a fat man on a motorbike really easily, but a you know a worm on a bicycle, a worm on a push bike was was no go. So you need something that's you know got a decent amount of volume in it uh, to give you the lift, uh, that's got some solidity, give you some structure. Um, so yeah, I think we did we. Sure. Yeah, we had a couple, quite a we've we we've turned down a few and you know there's a few more that you just that you just suck your teeth out and quote a good quote a big price and hope they never come off. <laughs> Have you ever done the quote a bit quote a big price and a go hopefully that will go away and they went brilliant can you make it? <laughs> yeah, it's happened and and you know usually it's worked out. So uh... <laughs> has there been a. a, a... Is there any kind of like regret again? Okay, well, I retired yesterday. No one ever came along and asked me to make an eaten mess or something, something strange. <laughs> I, you know, it's been um, so. No, I don't think so. I, you know, it's been. I've done some great balloons. I've done some great things. You know, I've, I've traveled. I've traveled around the world to uh, with projects. Uh, so you know, I, I think I've, I've done pretty well with a career, and I don't have any regrets about it. Mm. When, when you look back. When when you look back, what's your what's your sort of top three? If someone said, "What's your top three favorite designs you you actually worked on?" So I think uh, Fedor Konyakov's around the world balloon because yeah, I was lead engineer on that, um, so I was uh, all over that project. I think um, I'm really torn between between yeah, Rupert Bear was a real character and he stayed in the uk so i saw him a lot i'd go to balloon events and Rupert would be there but the disney castle was a more interesting project um mm -hmm. but more recently we did uh the red red bull don't look down project so we actually flew a a skate a, well, a, skate, a bmx bowl underneath a hot air balloon and that was just hilarious I'll come back to come back to red bull in a minute but just a kind of basic question you got Rupert Bear there, and his scarf and his arm are kind of sticking out. Yeah. So, are they sticking out purely because of the pressure of the hot air in there, or is, have you found some other way of, of of making that work? So, no, it's all about it's all about using the air pressure within the balloon. So, um, so with Rupert, his core is 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 what's creating the lift. That um, his arm is is filled up by with relatively small holes, so that it's. Um, it's mostly cooler air, but pressurized by the by the sort of the head of pressure inside the balloon. The real trick is the filling up bits down low. So Rupert's feet, uh, getting Rupert's feet to fill is quite a trick. And we do that by ducting pressure from higher up, up the balloon. And you you put a sort of some internal structure in. So you bring air down close to the surface that so cools. And then you get effectively a pool of, of cool air in the bottom of the balloon uh, to pressurize his feet that's fed by pressure from higher up. So you can make his feet stand up. So do you make like a if, if someone comes along and says Rupert, I need a Rupert or whatever it is, do you, is is that the first thing you make? Is that like a full scale Rupert or is there a mini Rupert that you get to test out? No, we just uh, we just uh, sit there with the CAD, make a model up, and then we uh, we set the machine going and lay into two or three kilometers of fabric. Uh, and when they blow him up for the first time, are you, are you not there going? I freaking hope those feet are going to inflate. Otherwise, yeah, I'm... yeah, you do that a bit. You do that a bit. Um, you know, and there are, you know, you sometimes get, you know, there's sometimes things don't quite work out as you imagined, and you're back in the factory reworking them. You know, occasionally we get we get a sewing error, and you know, and that could be be you know a bit awkward. Um, so, I think the the classic we made three Michelin men 
Michelin man had a, a we had a run of Michelin men, and we we lined them all up for a photo. They all came out of the factory, you know, first inflation to line them up for a photo, and one of them. Um, his arm was so there's one one segment of his arm was sewn 180 degrees out so we sort of <laughs> had a sort of was doing this kind of thing <laughs> and all the others were wait the other two were waving and so if you look from the picture we had to get him in the middle and tuck his arm behind one of the other balloons so that it wasn't quite so obvious <laughs> can, you can you explain a little bit more we, we briefly touched on that uh, kind of red bull don't look down thing i mean what what what, what bloody hell was that so um well, Red Bull, they've got their, their sponsored athletes and they, they they like stunts that get, you know, a lot of YouTube views and a bit of news. And um, and it was actually during COVID that it all that it all kicked off that uh, Chris Kyle, who's a BMX rider, he came up with this idea. I think his original idea involved having two balloons and two bowls and jumping from bowl to bowl. And then it all settled down a bit. It was going to be one really simple uh, rectangular bowl. And, you know, and that was going to be about a ton and we started working on that and then everyone thought that was going to be really just too dull and the bowl grew and grew and it became this quite complex um kind of kidney shape with big sticking up walls um and um uh, yeah that was really quite a project i mean from our point of view the engineering was fairly straightforward uh from our point of view it was all about the operation and about the airworthiness of it uh but, you know, it was a great team. You know, Chris was doing the riding. We had um, Monolith, who are a, a skate park bowl company, um, and they came up with the bowl concept. And then we had Red Bull Racing, who actually engineered the bowl. They did the bowl design and the structure of, of the bowl. Um, and it all came together. We had a day at uh, in, in Milton Keynes at Red Bull Racing, where we hoisted the whole thing up on a crane. Um, doing the, you know, getting Chris to ride it, hang on the crane. We did a static load test to uh, to kind of prove the structure was good. Um, and then we had, I think we had, yeah, we had four, we had four launch attempts. We had one, the first one, we took it to Kemble and it was just too windy. And we couldn't, because the real thing, that, the thing that's really hard operationally is getting the, the balloon, the balloon on top of the bowl. They're two really tricky bits, launching it and landing it. And um, we kind of figured landing would sort itself out. You know, just it goes, we, once you've got it off, it has to come down. So um, so we took it to Campbell. It was too windy to get the balloon back over the bowl. So then we went to Cardington. We actually managed to get a slot at Cardington about two or three weeks later. Um, and we took it to the airship hangars at Cardington. And we blew it all up in there. And we practiced getting the balloon onto the bowl and rigging it. We actually got the first rides of the bowl and um i gather it, it's a really horrible thing to ride because the bowl flexes and the bowl moves on the balloon the balloon bounces as well so apparently really hard to do those tricks on and yeah really odd to be in the basket of because when when chris is riding the bowl the basket's shaking yeah it's quite unusual and, did and you... then, uh, two and then we had two flights uh with it uh so um uh, so there was one that went at both of the, the successful flights out of Charlton Park. So, uh, yeah, in Wiltshire. Fantastic spot, you know, lovely house, fantastic grass runway. So great place to balloon from. And one ended up on Cologne, um, on, is it Cologne? Yeah, Cologne Airfield. And one ended up um, kind of the other side of Swindon. And I was lucky enough to be on the second one. But, um, yeah, it was quite a team for that. Um, Did you and, take your bike? Sorry? Did you take your bike? I didn't take my bike. No, I, you know, it's one of those, uh, you wouldn't get me riding that thing. I mean, so, um, so no, I, mean, I have to say, you know, with that one, a fair play to the CA. I know they're coming in for a lot of stick about the stuff about, you know, all the changes they make and, and, and how inflexible they can be. But I called up um, at the Civil Aviation Authority, our regular contact there. And I said, we've got this project. What do you think? And he said, yeah, yeah, we can make that work, oh, wow. and uh, you know, and then the project we actually got. So that was in the, in the quoting stage because I thought if the CA say no at this stage, then we can stop it. But then we said, yep, we'll make it happen. And then um, then I rang him up once the contract was signed, and I said, right, we're going to do this. How does it work? And he said, right, I don't know the how, but we, you know it's definitely good. Um, and I thought they were going to be all all over us with it. That we we're going to have CA permits to fly, and it's going to be a lot of trouble. But in the end, they went off to legal and they came back and they said, yeah, 
design organization flight conditions. So we wrote our own permit to fly for that. And, um, and you know, they took a bit more interest than our normal test flights. Um, and it was all good. Brilliant. Yeah. Cool. So if you had to look, if you had to look back over your, your ballooning career, with what would you say was the highlights was when you were chief engineer over the whole round the world flight for, for the, for the Arthur priest. Yeah. So I think, um, I think from a, yeah, from the, from the, the, the strictly work perspective, but you know, I've also done some great travel, you know, so I, I was in Canada last summer, there was an event in, um, oh, South of Montreal. So I went out to that, uh, they had about a hundred balloons there. So that was, that was really good fun. But, um, yeah, have, you so, the, have you done the Albuquerque balloon fiesta? No, I've never been to Albuquerque. I think, you know, perhaps if I had, I had one regret, you know, because that's, that's a legendary place to go, you know. Um, and I think in, you know, back in the 90s when it was in its real heyday, they had thousands, they had well over a thousand balloons. Um, and I've never been to that one. Very cool. Very cool. So what are you going to do with yourself now you're retired then? Well, uh, I've got to get the uh, the propeller back on my aeroplane, and then I'll start, start once the runway dries out at Wadswick. We'll uh, get a bit more flying in there, a uh, little bit more of the things I enjoy. But I'm also, you know, I'm not quite sure I'm done with the world of work yet. And you know, there seems to be a lot of, of stuff happening in the in the airworthiness space. You know, lots of, of new things going on. So I'm I might just you know find my get myself involved in some of that. I suspect you probably will somehow. <laughs> yeah, there seems to be a lot of activity. So, uh, so yeah, the it cool. all pans out a little bit. Very good. Well, we're, we're certainly glad that you're not, you're not, you won't be going away from the world of aviation. So uh, no, well, and I'll probably see what Fred just happened because I'm going out there to go into Yeah. Oh, well, we look forward to catching up there then. Yeah, there's, not, there's not many balloons there you know that yeah? no it's pretty thin on balloons but i go with my brother steve and all his gyro crowd so the, oh, yeah. uh, the uk magni team so Excellent. so we'll have a good time well Stay let's there. get together for a glass of water That's right. <laughs> fantastic well dave thank you very much okay. must be well, time for fancy hair oh. okay. what Double finger trouble there. So, oh, yeah. Mike Roberts says for uh, for Dave, CIA have airworthiness jobs being advertised. <laughs> do it. Don't do it. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah. So very I'm brilliant. I, I was actually I was at Garston Farm, which is the other strip I fly at, on the de on the the day that the Red Bull, um, the Red Bull Don't Look Down project flew past and landed at Cologne, and we there were a few of us guys on the ground going. What the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the aliens. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was brilliant. Uh, so this week, because Boom Supersonic announced that they'd made their first flight of their XB1 test aeroplane, that, which is their step on the way to their Overture supersonic airliner, we thought we would pick supersonic aircraft for our fancy hangar. But because they're perennial favourites, we said no Concorde or no SR-71. Mm -hmm. So who's first? Me, I'm going to jump in first as, as a regular loser on on this. I'm going to I'm going to jump in first, and I went I went for the B1 as, was known as the bone, and I think mean, it's, it's hard to imagine that it's got its roots in the 60s what? as a, one of one of the US's strategic bombers. I mean, I'm not you know I'm not a huge fan of of, 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 of bombers as it were, a pretty destructive kind of thing, but. Um, Three and a half, three and a half times the payload of a Lancaster, roughly, uh, and that's like one of the modified Lancasters that took the most. Um, clearly, delivered an awful lot faster. The, the swing wing aeroplane. Uh, I I kind of picked it because it's it, it's a kind of regular ish visitor to Oshkosh, and they yes. had have one parked up in in Aeroshell Square or Boeing Square or whatever the square is called these days, um, and and they flew it in the air show. It is just an unbelievably i mean talk about you know people you sometimes get ga advertisers going hey look at the ramp presence on my mooney ovation and you go mate that's not ramp presence that is ramp presence and i mean there was a guy who sort of got out put a set of steps and climbed into the engines in in white ovals to go and do some engineering type stuff the thing is just immense huge 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 airplane and so there you go i think one of those in my fantasy hangout 
Seems like that a really true. good idea. That is a really strong start. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, in the novel in that it had, if when you came to eject, um, the whole yes. cabin. The whole cabin. On. Yeah. Well, it's a bit like it's a bit like a gondola in a balloon, isn't it, really? Yes. If the balloon was going Mac two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't. I mean, you you wouldn't really want to be. What? Exposed to Mac two breeze, would you? No, no definitely not. Okay. Definitely not. So, um, but yeah, no, amazing thing. Very good. Um, mm -hmm. Who's next? Um, shall I go next as as a yes. guest? Go on, okay. John, David. All right. Well, as a newbie, I've got a very empty fantasy hanger here, so I thought I'd go for something pretty uh, big, impressive, and um, pretty sure that this is going to beat all of you guys. This is got to be the coolest, fastest supersonic aircraft. This aircraft didn't just cross oceans, wasn't limited by sonic booms. You could launch and accelerate to initially about 3,000 miles an hour. And then once you dropped the solid fuel uh, rockets, you could accelerate to 17,000 miles an hour, which is roughly, I think that's about Mach 24, 25. Um, had capacity for lots of friends and luggage which uh, if anyone knows my uh, my partner Jan will uh, appreciate how much she tends to travel with, so perfect for that. Um, and what, what about range? What about range? I mean, the longest flight uh, was 17 days and 11 million kilometers. Okay, you're just showing that's, 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 that's pretty good, pretty good. Orbited Earth 279 times on that mission, apparently. Uh, and then, and then when you come to land, you get your practice on your glide approaches. I mean, it's absolutely perfect. Um, also, the design. This surprised me when I looked into it. The design actually started. The concept went back. Started in 1966. Yeah, it's bonkers. Uh, which is also a great. Another reason I picked it because that was the year I was born. So uh, yeah. clearly, all good things were created in '66. And, uh, yeah, and then, um, yeah, it flew from 1981. Last flight was uh, 2011. And, and how about this? Final fact, the average cost per launch was 450 million US dollars. Yeah, okay. Quite punchy. That's so, quite, that's quite, and that is quite a lot of money, but, I mean, it, those figures are quite impressive. 17,000 yeah. miles an hour and God knows mm. how many thousand kilometers it was. And right? cost... Cost per kilometer. I mean, if it were 450 million, oh, yeah, three, that's, that's, 11 yeah. million kilometers. Yeah, it's probably, that's, it's probably that's, the same as Ford Escort, isn't it? Really? That's in terms of most kilometer. So, mm. right. Exactly. I'm sold. Yeah. Come on. It's, got, it's fantastic. Yeah. I want okay, one. If you want, if you want a really good book to read about the Shuttle Prime project, it says one out called Into the Black. Uh, I think uh, written by a guy called Roland White. That is a really good read if you're into your shuttle stuff. So, um, <laughs> so we get David, definitely a winner on the luggage front. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny, is it you next? Yeah, I've gone for a company that just produces cool stuff. Ah, you're going <laughs> supersonic in the car, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Saab, Saab, uh, Vigan for me is awesome. Mac two, um, just you know, operates off sort of unprepared strips off motorways, reverse thrust, room for a mate, although only one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just a, just a cool, cool looking airplane. Saab do apart from the the barrel. Um, I forgot the name of it now. The um, the Tunan, the, yes, yeah, the one that looks like a barrel. Yeah, um, yeah, the Vigan, the Gripen, Draken, all awesome airplanes. Um, and and I've forgotten that this was actually powered by a Volvo engine. Okay, was that two liter or two point five? <laughs> <And> two million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool machines. Well, I love Starbs. They're great. Yeah, very. That is yeah. very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, some strong I contenders there, then. Uh, it. Sorry. Some strong contenders there, eh? There are, some, are some very strong contenders there. I, I don't. I think anyone's going to struggle to challenge a David Space Shuttle. But I feel my choice is quite a good challenger. I picked this, the Convair B fifty eight Hustler. It was the first operational bomber capable of Mach two. Uh, developed in the fifties, and basically Convair had a much smaller little 
uh, Delta fighter called the F-102, and they used a similar platform for that, but made an enormous bomber out of it. Uh, crew of three, all who sat in individual cockpits, um, uh, and they all had their own little ejection capsules because you had to eject. You might have to eject at 70,000 feet at Mach 2. Um, it, it was a bonkers aeroplane. It could carry. It was a bomber, but only carried one weapon because it was such a slim aeroplane. Um, but it did set 19 speed records, including the longest supersonic flight in history, uh, when in 1963 it flew, flew from Tokyo to London, uh, 8,000 miles, uh, with five aerial refuelings in eight hours, um, averaging 938 miles an hour. People complain about electric cars that you have to stop to get the range on those. Like, come nine bloody refuelings, for God's sake. Five, yeah, five, five refuelings in eight hours, but you have done 8,000 miles. Uh, Convair even had plans to turn that into an airliner, uh, which would have carried 52 passengers at, at Mach 2. So, um, mm -hmm. the, but surprisingly, that never made it. But would have um, made a good biz jet. Sorry? It would have made a good biz jet. It would have made a good biz jet, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm definitely. I, I just love it because it's a bit. It's a bit. It looks like it could be straight out of um, uh, Jerry Anderson's Thunderbirds. Mm. Yeah, it does look very cool, lads. I have to admit. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, we have. Uh, what have we got? Uh, so David E. I did wonder if this would be a popular choice. David E. said the Lightning, of course. Mm. Uh, Pete Pegelli says the P1154, which was the supersonic carrier. Um, but that, that never made it to fruition. Paul Wheel's gone fantasy. He said Captain Scarlet's Angel Interceptor. Was oh. that um, a couple more for a lightning? Cat Burton. I'm not sure the F6 is the F16 supersonic. Hey. Johnny, you know military jets. F16, yeah. Yeah, it is supersonic, is it? Yeah. Okay. Good choice. Oh, Julian Treadwell's with me on the um, uh, B-58 or oh, the Vigilante. That was quite a, quite a thing, Pete Bengali, B-58 Hustler. I can see I might be winning later. Um, uh, what you, uh, I think there's no Concord. How about the TU? How about the 144, Mike? No. What about the what about the ones before the predis the, the Bristol, whatever it was, and the... And the... Oh, oh, I wonder oh. about that. The Bristol 188, which was yeah. the stainless steel... Um, stainless steel aeroplane powered by the brilliantly named de Havilland Gyron Jr. <laughs> <laughs> the, French, the French also had a had a kind of version of that, didn't they, as well? And they ended up. Yeah, yeah it was um, like battle of crazy aeroplanes. So there's um, a couple of there's a couple of Johnny wins in there, but I want to I want to put here so, so Ian wins, irrespective of the fuel or whatever the hangar four. Yeah, so we, yeah. we should be to be fair to David. There's David wins. There's a yeah, anything Saab is cool. Uh, uh, I do love a Vigan. Weird main gear. Johnny so far. Ed wins. Ed wins. I know where my V70 engine went. Ed wins. <laughs> Ian David Ty. Ian a TSR2 is a good choice. Uh, David wins. Um, yeah. Ambrose. Sorry, but XH558. The Vulcan wasn't supersonic. Looked like it should be, but wasn't. So... Um, David wins. Um, David wins tonight. Johnny and Ed wins. David wins. Ed close second. It could be a oh no, Johnny, Johnny. Who knew that the Saab had? I I didn't know that your Saab would have such a following, Johnny. Mm. Ian, yeah, Ian wins. Um, so um, Johnny, where where do you put the luggage in the Saab? In the um, beauty box. <laughs> you send it commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, there we go. Everyone's a winner. Oh, it looks like everyone's a winner except Ian. That's harsh, Annabelle. <laughs> I think, didn't Annabelle used to work for us? Uh, <laughs> at one time, apparently, yes. Well, Not right. anymore. <laughs> yes, she came onto a fancy hangar and like blew it off. That's it. Well, very good. I, th I think we can, um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I think we might have to call a Johnny David tie there. So. Yeah, I think I think a Johnny David tie. And yes. as to be fair, yeah, yeah one's, one's a kind of transit van with a long range and, and loads of luggage. And <laughs> a sports car that you, I wonder if you could fit the Saab in the payload deck of the. Mm. I think you could definitely fit the You could fit many Saabs in the payload deck. I know, obviously, we should remember as well with the space shuttle is the only supersonic airplane that comes with blankets. Because when you look at it, if you've ever seen the space shuttle up close, you realize that actually the outside is like like thermal blankets and stuff it's really yeah. really really odd yeah. but it looks like a super smooth thing from a distance so. yeah. yeah no i think 
yeah, I, I think a combination of those two would be, would be a great SUV or a decamper oh. type thing, wouldn't it? Mm. It they would. Could, they could both fit in my uh, my hangar. Yeah. So I've been chatting. Okay, yeah. you might have to you might have to part them out in shares with Johnny. But... Yeah, Johnny wins. Love a turbo. <laughs> cool, cool, good events. Um, there's an Easter Bunny fly in. Um, obviously Shuttleworth on the thirty thirtieth thirty first of March. Uh, Private Flyer Fest Ireland at Ballyboy Airfield on the fifth and sixth of April, and Whirlybird Sunday Northcote on the seventh of April. Brilliant. Well, in that case, it, it remains just to, for me to say thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much, Sky Demon, for um, supporting us. Thank you very much, David, for um, joining us and for bidding with Airability. A great charity again. Don't forget to support Airability when you can. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, team. Uh, enjoy the weather over the weekend, which is not as bad as I thought it might be. At least that's what Simon says. Whether that actually transpires or not, we'll have to find out. But uh, yeah. it's been pretty wild today. But otherwise... Have a great weekend's flying. Have a great Easter. Enjoy your chocolate. And we'll see you again Wednesday afternoon for the live stream extra, if you remember. If not, why not? Give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Hit that bell. All that kind of YouTube kind of stuff. It does help us, actually. So that would be great if you can do that. Don't, so, don't eat too many Easter eggs. And don't, no, don't eat too many Thank Easter you. Eggs. Thank you, guys, for having me. Putting up with it's me. It's really our okay. pleasure, David. Thanks for Thank supporting me. Thank you very much, me. everyone. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye.